Today we will consider a conversation with a new ager. This is actually a succinct retelling of a conversation betwixt myself and an adherent of the new age worldview. When it comes to evangelization, apologetics, polemics, or into whichever field your ministry takes you, you ought to be confident in standing on the truth of Yahweh's word, the Bible, and his Holy Spirit. As it has been stated, know what you believe and why you believe it. It is of secondary importance to know something about that which others believe. There are some standard things to keep in mind in this regard, such as not telling others what they believe, but asking them to define their views and terminology. For example, you can ask a Jew, a Muslim, a Mormon, a Buddhist, an atheist, a New Ager, etc. Do you believe in Jesus? And they will all say yes. But to the Jew, Jesus could be a prophet whose followers mistakenly deified or a false prophet. To the Muslim, Jesus is one of many prophets who were all superseded by Muhammad. To the Mormon, Jesus is one of many sons of one of the many Mormon gods. To the Buddhist, Jesus was a Bodhisattva or another Buddha. To the atheist, Jesus was just a man who had some nice things to say, if that is they believe Jesus existed at all. To the New Ager, Jesus was an ascended master. You see, you get the picture. All terms must be defined by both sides of the conversation, lest it is thought that agreement is being reached, while what is being agreed to is mere terminology and not substance. In fact, this New Ager claims that she's a Christian because she believes in Jesus. However, what she means by both Christian and Jesus is not what traditional Christianity is, and likewise with Jesus. A fellow parishioner brought her New Age friend to services one Sunday, and the New Ager wanted, wanted to speak to someone. Being the styled resident apologist, she was directed to me. She very quickly stated that the pastor had stated some things in his sermon with which she completely disagreed. I assured her, well, I'm sure we all feel that way sometimes. Empathy has a way of disarming. Well, her statement was great news because it meant that she had a standard of truth upon which she was basing her disagreement. And so I would be able to question, what is truth? Let us very succinctly take a step back and consider just what is meant by New Age. In a manner of speaking, New Age is a very, very wide, general and generic term for a belief in a very, very wide range of concepts. For example, a New Ager generally holds that our universe is an illusion. This may come in various forms, from it being an actual illusion, such as the dream that a deity is having, such as in forms of some forms of uh, Hinduism, to basing such a view on the fact that, as this particular New Age stated, matter is mostly empty space. Note that many New Agers appeal to what perhaps may be best termed pseudophysics for some of their views about energy, vibrations, etc. Yes, matter is mostly empty space, but matter is matter nevertheless. She did her firm an actual existing material realm. What one needs to be on the lookout for is appealing to actually verified empirical science in order to come to metaphys metaphysical conclusions. For example, noting that we all vibrate, which is true, but concluding that we can evolve spiritually by heightening our vibration. God may be a higher being, but is likely to be a non-personal cosmic spirit or energy which infuses all things. Spirit guides, ascended master, higher beings, and other terms are used for non-physical beings who are more spiritually evolved than us, than us and who can help us. UFOs are generally appealed to and maybe the work of actual aliens from other parts of the universe, maybe higher beings or angels, mistakenly thought of by us as being aliens, etc. Much, much more could be said, but the point is that one needs to be ready for virtually anything. For example, 
I knew a new ager who had a conversation with a tree which could travel through time. He also claimed that when he was taken aboard a UFO, he asked the aliens if they knew where any gold was, and they showed him some images of landscapes. Thus, he would occasionally drive around the mountains where he lived to see if anything looked familiar. Upon arriving at our meeting, she stated that she did not know why she was here, but that she was supposed to be. Here meaning a meeting with a member of the, a Christian church. As it turns out, she was mostly interested to learn what Christians were being taught nowadays. She came from a Christian background, whatever that means, had been away from the church for a very long time and was curious to learn what was occurring therein today. Thus, she initially and specifically asked about my view of God. Well, in my life, BC, I had been somewhat involved in the New Age movement, and so I knew how to approach her and that there were certain things that were sure to come up, as well as certain things with which we must deal. Certainly, this seemed like an open door to preach the gospel to her, but I thought she could find just about anyone who would do that. However, she would proceed in accordance to her modus operandi, the basic New Age manner whereby she was accustomed to doing things. She would hear it and decide what portions to keep and which to discard. This would be based on how the gospel matched or did not match her preconceived notions. I thought that she could not find just anyone who would question her and have her dig deep into herself and her beliefs. My purpose was to have her face the fact, in fact it is, that she had absolutely nothing upon which to rely for that which she held to be true. I purposed to question her presuppositions, and so we began by discussing truth. I gracefully sidestepped her question, noted that she had told me of her disagreement with the pastor, and noticed, noted that she was making truth claims. She had to be basing her disagreement upon something something with which the pastor was conflicting, and it was that something about which I wanted to know. The reply was all but expected, and was that the issue is that the pastor was expressing, quote-unquote, his truth, and that she was expressing, quote-unquote, my truth. This has been a very popular manner whereby to look at disagreements for a long time and is used by many people. It even came up in a 2012 episode of Donald Trump's Celebrity Apprentice. I explained that truth has no ownership, and so it cannot be mine, yours, or anyone's. Rather, truth is absolute. That it is absolute is the very definition of truth. It is the very concept of truth. Now, absolute means that something is that which it is, regardless of whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, whether we prefer it be different or not, whether we know about it or not. I use this as an example. If I believe sincerely with all my heart and mind that 2 plus 2 equals 5, is this true? No. But it is my truth. No, it is not even my truth due to the fact that it is not true. Since 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true, then 2 plus 2 equals 5 is not true. Yes, indeed, 2 plus 2 equals 5 can be said to be something that is my view, something that I believe, something that I claim, etc. But it is not true, as it does not reflect the truth. Then came another all but expected statement, which was an appeal to the story of the blind man and the elephant. The story proves that all is but perception and each has their own truth. A group of blind men, or shall we say visually challenged non-gender specific personages, gathered around and felt an elephant. One feels the tail and claims that it is a rope. Another feels the ear and claims that it is a fan. Yet another, feeling the leg, states that it is a tree trunk. On it goes, you get the picture. Each has their own perception, conclusion, idea, and thus their own truth. It is all relative. I reiterated her conclusion so as to ensure that we understood each other. Indeed, that was her point. 
Then I inserted a Lieutenant Columbo moment. You know the one? A there's something about this that's bothering me moment. I noted that, yes, indeed, each had their own view, but they were all blind. Whilst we have 20-20 vision and can see the elephant. The story is actually the exact opposite of what so many people think it is. The point is that we know that it is an elephant. Blind men are all claiming to know what it is, but they are all wrong. And we know that they are wrong because the absolute truth is that it is an elephant. They can believe what they will, but they are wrong, period. Well, thereafter, whenever such an issue as conflicting views came up, she would catch herself and replace my or your truth with my view or belief and your view or belief. Of course, if you ever deal with anyone who denies absolute truth, you just ask them if their claim is absolutely true. If it is, which it is, then they have just admitted to absolute truth. If it is not, well then, uh, just tell them that since their claim is not absolutely true, then you will feel free to disregard it. Now one thing is the conceptual acknowledgement that there is such a thing as truth, absolute truth at that. Yet. How we discern the truth is in another matter altogether. Thus, I noted that she kept referring to things, her views, as if they were so. But just how had she come to them? Well, this is another all but expected statement to the effect of that she runs concepts through her heart and sees how it feels. Indeed, from New Agers to Mormons, this is just about the only thing that many have. Just see how it feels. If it feels right, then it is so, and if it does not, then it is not so. Very interesting, but I asked if she had ever had that experience of passing something by her heart filter, having it feel right and true, but then later on changing her mind, discerning that it was not right and not true after all. Her answer was that, yes, that happens, quote unquote, all the time. Well then, I noted that she had admitted that the manner of ascertaining truth is unreliable. Oddly, she agreed. How could she not? But later on, whenever I would note that she was making a truth claim which she felt in her heart was right and true, and I would remind her that she had admitted that her method was unreliable, she would actually deny it, stating that I had said that and not her. However, when we discussed the particulars of that which she considered to be true, we did agree that it was, almost, completely tentative. This may have meant that she was coming to terms with and attempting to accommodate the realization of the tentative nature of her views on the spot, but I do not know. This too is a lesson, as attempting to, quite literally, come to grips with a New Ager's views is tantamount to grasping a handful of helium. In fact, you may find that New Agers will both agree and also disagree with everything you say. Note the qualifying term, almost completely tentative. This is because she made reference to a set of core beliefs, such as that there is one God, that we are to be tolerant and accepting each other as we are, etc. However, I noted that she cannot even claim that she has a core because a core implies a firm foundation and this is precisely that which she is lacking, not to the particulars of that which she considers true. She would preface her truth statements by referencing, quote unquote, in my readings, such and such, so that her readings revealed that this or that is a truthful fact. I asked her to what she was referring by readings. It turned out that she reads the writings of New Age spirit channelers, who are people who open themselves up to communicating with who knows who or what. These spirits are sometimes ascended masters or more spiritually evolved beings, messengers from another time or universe, aliens, or, and actually, in short, demons. 
Once I got her to see that even her most cherished core beliefs were tentative, she took a fallback position and employed a term and concept, which is that all that there is, is the eternal now. In a way, this makes sense because after all, we do not inhabit the past nor the future. Rather, there is a future which momentarily becomes the present, the now, and instantly becomes the past. This is simply the nature of the time-space continuum in which we live, linear time. However, it is noteworthy to consider that she's employing this concept as a tool, a styled psychological band-aid. You see, since she has no foundation upon which to base even her supposedly core beliefs, she must rely on what? She relies on what she believes right now. She must live in the now because she must hold on to that which she believes right now as an anchor to whatever reality might be. She must hold on to that ever fleeting now because she knows that she has nothing else. But upon what is the now based? Well, nothing, but she has to have something. I wanted to show her what was clear to me, which is that she has no basis upon which to base any of her beliefs at all. Thus, over and over and over again, whenever I discerned that she was making a truth claim and a surgeon, I would say, but that's just for right now, right? And she would agree, at which time I would follow up with, and it could change tomorrow, right? And she would agree. I wanted her to face again and again the fact that everything she said, thought, and believed was utterly lacking any foundation whatsoever. I took this even further by asking, stating, that in fact, she may even change her mind about how she determines truth. I said that tomorrow she may decide not to run things through her heart filter, but may decide to run things through her brain and treat it as data, ones and zeros. Yes, she agreed that even her manner of determining truth was tentative. But back to her readings, via which she held as a core belief, that there is one God, whatever God may mean to her. How does she justify claiming that there is only one God? She sought to buttress this by claiming that we all believe in one God. Firstly, when two people claim to believe in one God, the one God in which they believe could be a different God. For example, the one God of Christianity has a son, but the one God of Islam could not have a son. But that is another issue. I asked her how, if, say, the majority of the world became Hindus and were therefore polytheists, could she then claim that monotheism is true? Well, it would be her claim against theirs, and we must tolerate and accept each other. Great, but we must continue to question her presuppositions, and so it must be asked, why tolerance? Why acceptance? Why love? What if, I asked, I determined that it was beneficial for, to me, my clan, tribe, family, city, nation, etc., to violently conquer others? Well, this brought us to the assertion that we all have a path to God. Well, this is also a very popular claim and a very all-encompassing, tolerant view. However, this too must be questioned. You see, when people say such things, they are thinking about that elderly Jewish gentleman davening, uh, praying, at the Western Wall, that smiling Buddhist monk meditating on a mountaintop, a whirling dervish, etc. But something that people who say such things generally do not consider is that which I made her consider. So, we all have a path to God. All of us. But what, I asked, if I decided that my path to God was that I would fly an airplane into a building. She had to affirm that, yes, indeed, that would be my path to God. I took it up a notch and referenced that of Adolf Hitler's Nazism, and she affirmed yet again that, indeed, that was Hitler's path to God. He showed us a way to God. Once you assert we all have a path to God, you have included us all, excluded none of us, and thus must, logically, accept that each and every, all, paths are to God, regardless. You see, one of the problems here 
is that if you believe that we all have a path to God, then how do you condemn anything as being immoral? Although if someone insists, perhaps you could agree and state, indeed, we all have a path to God, some to meet him as judge and some as savior. Almost in passing, she noted that the Bible was dismissive of women. Well, how does she condemn this as the biblical writers and the Jews and Christians are all on a path to God? But I thought to squelch this common misconception, which only takes about one minute. I noted that if she wanted to say something to the likes of that the, Ro the medieval Roman Catholic Church had a problem with women, this was one thing, but the Bible itself? I told her off the top of my head that in the Bible we find that males and females were both created in the image of God, women had the right to own land, receive inheritance, were prophetesses in both testaments, were judges, were disciples, were deaconesses, were teachers, worked and owned their own businesses, were present at the day of Pentecost, books of the Bible were named after women, Ruth and Esther. Women were the first of the empty tomb, while the male apostles were, in, uh, were hiding in fear. Now, for 90% of the conversation, it was the case that we all have a path to God. However, she then changed her mind when referring to 1987 AD. What, pray tell, occurred in 1987 AD? Some may recognize that year as the year of the great harmonic convergence championed by such notable New Agers as Jose Arguelles. This was supposedly a time of spiritual vibrational enlightenment. At this time, she claimed they determined that 51% of humanity did not want to be destroyed by an earthbound asteroid, but wanted to continue in this plane of existence. She identified the they as beings whom I would refer to as angels. I did not sidetrack us at this time, but it is noteworthy that what I refer to as angels and what she was referring to are completely different things, different beings. In any case, at that time, those who truly are on a path to God were kept on earth, whilst those who are not began being removed along with their influence into another realm of existence. So now I had her affirm that we do not all have a path to God, but some of us do and some do not. She agreed. But, and yes indeed, I am a Socratic gadfly, I then asked her if even those who had been removed would eventually reach God. She agreed. Of course, she could not have anyone forever condemned, but even those so far removed from being on a path to God that they had to be removed would eventually and somehow find their way to God. As an aside, with regards to being a Socratic gadfly, let us take a moment to generally consider the Socratic method, or rather, being a Jew, I prefer the term rabbinic method. Have you ever spoken to someone and it is obvious that they are not listening, but just waiting for you to take a breath so as to cut you off and get their way? When that happens, or something like it, it is not even a case of in one ear and out the other. It never makes it in. This is why it is preferable to ask probing questions rather than simply making statements. When you ask questions, you cause the person to actually think about issues and thus cause them to actually construct connections in their brain whereby they handle the information. By allowing them to consider issues via answering questions, you are ensuring that, as it were, the seeds of thought have been planted and they cannot as easily go unwatered thereafter. Now, when she referenced the 51%, I wiped my forehead with a whoosh of relief and noted that 51% is awfully close to half. What a relief. I mentioned that to refer to 51% is a very specific data point and asked how she knows that it was 51% and not, for instance, 52%, etc. She stated that she did not know. For that matter, how did she know this even took place, this global survey? Well, her readings. And how did she know her readings are accurate? Well, you know the answer. In fact, she also referenced our four bodies, which is another popular New Age belief 
which are generally listed as the physical body, the mental body, the emotional body, and the ethereal body. I asked how she knew that. Perhaps we have 12 bodies. She replied that she did not know. Understand that we are all exclusivists. If for no other reason than inclusivists exclude the exclusivist, and thus show themselves to not be inclusivists, but exclusivists. Here's a simple proof. Claim that we are all exclusivists. And if someone disagrees with you, simply note that they just proved your point, as they have just excluded you from those who hold true views. You will note that I could take her in any direction I wanted, get her to agree with me, and then I could reverse our direction and get her to agree with me yet again. I was doing this in order to show her again and again and again and again that since she had no base, no foundation, she was being tossed to and fro with any whim of, well, wherever I wanted to go. If I asked her a point about point A, I was already at point Z in my mind and would simply walk her from B to Y and let her stumble into Z. It was the concept of the lawyer who does not ask a question to which he does not already know the answer. It is like playing chess and getting your opponent to be forced into a position that will draw them into your trap. Yet, she is not my opponent and is certainly not the enemy. She is a victim of the enemy. I should note that all this is to be done out of sympathy, empathy, love, respect, calmliness, and not pride or boastfulness. In fact, I would take the time to consider what she said, indicate that I was attempting to understand her, reiterate her position to ensure that I was getting it right, and then ask simple probing questions which left her to have to face her folly all by herself without pushing her in terms of shoving in her face or any such thing. Another issue arose about her readings. She had made the ubiquitous claim that the Bible could not be relied upon because it had been translated and interpreted so very many times. Well, I quickly noted that, for example, for the Old Testament, the oldest manuscript we had prior to 1940 was the Masoretic text, which dated to circa 800 AD. Let us round it to a thousand years ago. Then, in the 1940s, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, which took us back to circa 2,000 years ago. Now we could see, by leaps and bounds of millennia, 2,000 years ago, compared to 1,000 years ago, compared to today, and we could see that, in essence, that which the Bible says is the very same. Well, she noted that this was because there are certain elements of fundamental truth. You see what I mean about New Agers both agreeing and also disagreeing with everything you say? The Bible is corrupt, except when it is not. It is corrupt, but when it is proven to not be corrupt, then it is not corrupt because it contains certain fundamental truths. How do you know? What are they? How do you determine them? Yes, all these are the very same relevant questions we discussed all along. She noted that, as an example of the incorruptible Bible's corruption, or something, that reincarnation had been, pay attention to the qualifying term here, taken out of the Bible. This was great to hear. Because if she had said the Bible simply neglected to reference reincarnation, that is one thing. But she claimed that it had been taken out, removed from the Bible. I noted that if that was the case, it was a simple enough case. For the Old Testament, we have major manuscripts that are 2,000 years and 1,000 years old, plus many, many other fragments. For the New Testament, we have some 24,000 manuscripts about five and a half thousand in Greek and the rest in other languages. Thus, if it was taken out, all we had to do is look at an earlier manuscript which refers to reincarnation, then look at more recent manuscripts in which the reference is missing, and voila, proof that it was taken out. Well, she had an answer to this, and it was that the manuscripts which still can be shown to reference reincarnation are hidden away in the Vatican. Lack of evidence is not evidence. Clearly, someone once claimed that it was taken out of the Bible and had no evidence when asked for it, so they concocted a tale about a Vatican conspiracy. I noted that, thusly, one could claim anything was in the Bible. 
It was taken out and hidden away in the Vatican. She assured me that she would provide me the evidence. I'm still waiting. While we're at it, she also claimed that Jesus acquired his mystical wisdom and abilities while traveling in Egypt, Tibet, India, etc. And learned from all the great masters of those religions. This too is a very, very common claim. It is common enough that it was researched in detail and discredited. No, it was not researched via an internet search engine, but via actual boots on the ground. People who traveled to the various localities where Jesus supposedly traveled, to the many places said to still contain records of Jesus' stay. And what was turned up was just a lot of very confused monks and otherwise holy men who had no idea what the researchers were talking about. Of course, Jesus did some of his growing up in Egypt, but that he learned the mystical ways of their gods and clergy is simply unknown. It is not mystical, but mythical. In this regard, she made yet another expected and popular claim, which is that the human man, Jesus, became the Christ when he advanced spiritually enough to tap into the Christ consciousness, which is something we all can do. Of course, the Bible preempts this claim by stating, quote, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, Luke 2.11. Thus, Jesus was the Christ, meaning the Messiah, the Anointed One, and was so from birth. Oh, right. This must have been inserted into the text later. And the earlier manuscripts, which do not include this statement, are, well, you know where. What Jesus, who became the Christ, learned in his travels and studies were certain, what is generally known as power words or phrases which are known in common parlance as positive affirmations. This means that he learned key words and phrases which amounted to the power to change reality. Within Christianity, you may be aware of the word faith movement, the prosperity gospel, name it and claim it, or blab it and grab it. The context is different, but the concept is exactly the same. For example, she stated that you have to be very careful about what you say after having said, I am. For example, Jesus learned a very powerful phrase, I am the resurrection and the life, and likewise claimed to be the I am. So she stated that every morning she says things to herself, or rather to the universe, or what have you, I am perfect health, I am perfect vision and explain that people use these affirmations, which include references to wealth. This is fascinating indeed. So I asked whom, out of all those people she knew who did this, including herself, is perfectly healthy, had 20-20 vision, she's a septuagenarian, is wealthy, etc. The expected answer was, of course, that since such results require such a high level of spiritual development, no, she did not know of any. This is reminiscent of a conversation which I ear witnessed between a Buddhist and a young lady who was suffering pretty badly. The Buddhist essential, unempathetic, and dismissive statement to her was that the Buddha taught that if she were to cease from desire, she would cease from suffering. Upon being asked how she could go about doing that, note that she now desired to rid herself of desire, the Buddhist, even more unempathetically and dismissively, stated that he did not know, as such results required, well, you know, the rest of it. Great concepts on the surface, but results are elusive, to say the least. Now, a few of Jesus' I am statements came up as she affirmed that Jesus came to show us the way. This is very significant. Note that she qualified it accurately. She did not claim that Jesus came to show us a way, one of many, but rather the way, one. But she followed up that Jesus did not say, no one comes to the Father except through me. I pointed out that indeed Jesus had not come to show us a way, but came to show us the way. And what was this way? It was Jesus himself. You see, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. John 14, 6a. And since the way is he, 
himself, he could therefore go on to state, no one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6b. Let us back up a moment to recall her claim that the Bible was unreliable and corrupt due to the many translations and interpretations. I asked if her readings included reading the writings of channelers who weren't from other countries. Yes, they were, although she claimed that the United States has become a center of such activity. In that case, I asked how she knew that what she read was reliable, not corrupt. After all, the channeler, the channeler interprets the Spirit's message, writes it down, it is translated into English, she reads it, and further interprets it, etc. She had to affirm that even in her readings she did not know if what she was reading was reliable and incorrupt, but judged it via her heart filter. So it must be the case that even when it came to her truth claims based upon her readings, she could not be assured beyond the fleeting eternal now, yes an oxymoron, but one to which she is temporarily beholden, that these things were so. Agreed. Just for right now, and tentative. Now, let us get personal. As it turns out, sadly, and not surprisingly, that she came from a background of very severe and strict Christian parents, Sunday school teachers, etc. Thus, she peppered some comments with disparaging remarks about religion. I assured her that when it came to religion, we agreed completely. When what is meant by religion is a man-made, hierarchical, authoritative system, then indeed religion is the greatest corruption ever conceived by humanity and one of the greatest obstacles between humans and Yahweh. I summarized how the Bible is the most anti-religion book, set of books, ever published and that the New Testament concludes, quote, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James 1, 27. I noted that in the Old Testament, Yahweh ends up condemning religion. Mind you, this was the very religion with priesthood and laws and sacrifices which Yahweh himself had established. She interrupted here in order to state that she did not believe it. Well, how do you know? Actually, that question had to wait, because the point was to get her to see, well, the point. I spoke about the phenomena of being institutionalized, whereby, for example, a person who gets out of prison after decades find that they cannot function. This is because they have become institutionalized, as for decades they have been told what to do and when to do it. 24-7. Think about the Hebrews of slaves in Egypt for four centuries. Imagine that you are a slave, your parents were slaves, their parents were slaves, etc. Now imagine sudden freedom. The Hebrews were institutionalized and actually longed for that which was familiar. Idols, familiar foods, etc. Yahweh had to build up a people from the ground up by providing commandments, laws, authorities, rituals, etc., which were meant to teach something individually and nationally. By observing holidays, sacrifices, kosher laws, etc., they were supposed to become a people, worshippers of Yahweh. Yet, there came a time when the priests were corrupt and made people loathe temple services. There came a time when people offered sacrifices to Yahweh, which they would not even have seen fit to offer to their governors. There came a time when these life lessons, which were meant to provide true spiritual growth, became nothing but empty religion and people were just robotically jumping through ritualistic hoop. This is when Yahweh said no more and condemned the man-made manner whereby they were going about doing religion. Point being, do not feel as if you have to defend the undefensible. Once I understood what she meant by religion, I was more than glad to agree actually take its condemnation further and get to the point that what Jesus offers is not religion but relation. While I believe that all things eventually break down into spiritual warfare, there was a manifestation of that war in terms of psychological factors. You see, when she heard certain terms, she would disregard the context in which those terms were being used, define them with her own concept, 
and then react negatively towards what turns out to not be what was actually stated, but towards her misunderstanding or rather misinterpretations. For example, what the pastor had stated with which she completely disagreed is that the Bible's main message is relationship. No, she insisted, it is not about relationship, but about love. Well, indeed, but I noted that relationship is based upon love. She denied this and made reference to, for example, abusive relationships. Well, certainly, but within the context of a sermon, a very specific sort of relationship was being referred to. A relationship based upon love. It was the context of the sermon which de defined the term relationship. This is a proper interpretive principle and common sense. However, since she uncontextually expanded the definition of relationship beyond the confines of the context, she proceeded to read her misdefinition of the term into the sermon, which resulted in an utter miscomprehension of that which the sermon was meant to convey. She likewise referenced a very lovely lady's luncheon she had attended, which included a very nice message one. However, the message made reference to Jesus having been a sacrifice, which he most certainly was not, in her view. She explained that as she was growing up, she was expected to sacrifice for family, for work, her country, etc., and this resulted in being unfulfilled as the self was sacrificed for everyone and everything else. Do you see the pattern? Again, she inserts her loaded definition of a term into the message. This results in the message being misunderstood, and she is left to reject not the actual message, but her misunderstanding of it. In her view, Jesus gave himself, but he was not sacrificed or a sacrifice. Well, yes, Jesus gave himself, and was given, as a sacrifice. I noted this to her, and later on took it farther still, by pointing out that when she referred to Jesus, and I referred to Jesus, we were not referring to the same person. Thus, I pointed out that it seemed to me that she was not viewing Jesus as he really is, as those who actually knew him, walked with him, talked with him, traveled with him, ate with him, portrayed him. Rather, she was coming to Jesus with preconceived notions in her mind, and these preconceived notions were actually blurring the real Jesus and leaving her with a Jesus made in her own image. This is how and why she could read the New Testament and parse it. Jesus said this, but did not say or do that. She was not basing this upon grammatical context, historical context, cultural context, manuscript-based higher criticism, or any such thing, but merely by the feeling her way through the text. You may have noted that earlier I employed the term judge, as in that she judged it via her heart. This is because the issue of judgment, passing judgment, being judgmental, is another expected issue which one must breach with New Age. She noted that one thing upon which she was working spiritually is to cease judging. I replied that we all pass ju judgments all day long when deciding what is true and false, when considering ours and other people's behaviors, when deciding what to eat, what to wear, etc. Indeed, but she meant more judging with regards to other people because we must accept people as they are. I pointed out that Jesus taught, quote, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Close quote, Matthew 7, 1 through 2. Thus you will be judged in a manner which you yourself judge. This brings us to another of Jesus' statements on the matter, which is, quote, Do not judge according to appearances, but judge with righteous judgment. Close quote, John 7, 24. The problem is not judgment, but rather how we judge. In fact, if someone con condemns judgmentalism, they are judging judgment to be condemnable and also condemning judgmentalism. And two judgments do not make for a condemnation of judgment. She mentioned that in her youth she was judged and judged severely. One simply must be sympathetic with this as she is obviously still affected by it over half a century later. However, I just had to ask, or rather point out, that according to her very own standards, 
she had to first affirm that those people who had severely judged her were on a path to God, and secondly, that she had to accept them as they were. Indeed, she had to agree. Yet, I wanted to dig a little deeper into this, as she had mentioned her concern for that which children were being taught, both by Christians and society. She implied that Christians were likely still teaching children that they were sinners, while society did not offer them any self-esteem, but, but encouraged them to feel bad about themselves if, as an example she gave, their belly stuck out a little bit. As an aside, Christianity's theology contains a tension, as it were, between affirming that we are all created in God's image and that we are condemned sinners, but that Jesus came to save us from our sins. As far as society, she has, seems to have gotten it backwards. Yes, there are some very troubling issues pertaining to, for example, body image. However, even children who are morbidly obese at a time when their metab metabolisms are supposed to be able to melt steel are being told that they are beautiful, should not feel bad about themselves, and maybe there's a health concern or something. Our society is swimming, nay, drowning in self-esteem. Feel good about yourself and tell yourself that you're a good person regardless of the evidence to the contrary. In fact, our problem is not lack of self-esteem, but lack of God-esteem. Quote, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Isaiah 53, 3. In any regard, all this to say that I also wanted her to see that this whole thing about accepting others as they were is faulty. At this point, it may be useful to know that someone once stated that God loves us just the way we are, but that he loves us way too much to let us stay that way. Thus, I noted that with regards to her concern for children in relation to accepting others as they are, on their own path to God, etc., it goes beyond simple acceptance. This, again, is generally thought of in purely positive terms, such as that all nice people can be accepted as they are. It is, of course, more, more difficult to accept the non-nice as they are, to, the, to love the unlovable. I made her think about this. It is not just a case of you do your thing and I'll do mine, and we just accept each other as we are, because some of us are teaching children that with which others of us disagree. As the night closed and we exchanged parting pleasantries, she told me that I had solidified some things for her. God is in control and we all have a path to God. So in the end, did I simply succeed in driving her even deeper into the new age? Well, perhaps. One thing with which a Christian must be comfortable is that it is not our job to convert anyone. Jesus told us to make disciples and not converts. A disciple is a person who wants to learn. Our job is to plant or water a seed, and it is the Holy Spirit's job to convert. But what did she mean by concluding that God is in control and we all have a path to God? I most certainly do not know. However, this is the sense I got. Have you ever heard the term, let go and let God? It is a way of metaphorically throwing one's hands up and saying, well, there's nothing more I can do. I am done, tapped out, finished. God will take care of it, etc. It is a, perhaps righteous, resignation and admission of having reached the end of our ability's rope. I believe that she had to come to terms again and again and again with the fact that she had nothing. All of her beliefs had been shown to be nothing but tentative feelings. She even had to confront that the manner whereby she comes to her beliefs is nothing but a tentative feeling. She was done, finished, emptied, weighed and found wanting. Thus, she affirmed that God is in control because she most certainly had none. She affirmed that we all have a path to God because she simply lost her ability to discern anything at all. Thus, she had to admit that I had a certain something. She wanted to hold on to her certain something. And since these certain somethings conflicted, we both must somehow be able to have our certain somethings and need them too.